Over 50 years, people have come to see the Sharks play. Talent. Skill. Speed. Intelligence. Elite level athleticism. That's not these guys. Biased. One-eyed. Opinionated. More often wrong than right. They make up for their complete lack of talent with pure dribble, gibberish, and enthusiasm. This is the E.T. Stand Podcast. 20th of April, 2015. Monday night, Ramonda Stadium, Sharks, Souths. Halftime. This introduction isn't of a moment, but of a concept. The 2014 Wooden Spooners are leaving the 2014 Premiers at the break. After having the breeze their backs in the first half, the Sharks have only a slender six-point advantage to show for it and must now run down towards the southern end, straight into the teeth of an East Coast low that is producing cyclonic headwinds. Wind gusts of over 100 kilometres an hour, to be exact. Can the Sharks hold on? Or after the horrors of the Asada years, will it just be more of the same? Welcome to another episode of Classic Cronulla Chronicles. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ET Stand, the Canal Sharks fan podcast, where we are talking to the football tonight. You'll notice a difference. Uh, this is the first time we've had two uh, flavour commentators, two expert analysts on this show, uh, and they were two of the 3,978 people in attendance on that fateful evening. That's 0.05% of the crowd. Uh, so this is definitely by far the highest percentage we've had uh, for a, a uh, an attendance ever. Uh, hopefully that's not to happen again, but I'm sure these conditions will. So with me, we've got Chris Kelly and Franco. They were both there. Kelly, I will start with you. Your story starts a bit earlier in the day. How the hell did you make the decision to head, in your case, north, uh, head down to Shark Park and experience that in all its, all its glory? Well, at, at the time, I was still living in the Shire, so it was still not, I didn't have to travel as okay. far, but obviously, uh, Sydney weather was in the middle of a, a deluge and gone on for a couple of days. It was absolutely getting, like you said, lashed with 100k cyclonic winds and heavy rains. Um, and young Zach was staying with his uh, grandfather that day, went to the shops and ran into one Luke Lewis and uh, got his photo with him. It was Zach's favourite player at the time. And so I got a little photo with him and he came home and said, no, nah, let's go to the game. I said, mate, look out. Oh, like it's horrendous. He goes, no, no, I want to go, I want to go. And like, all right, we'll go to this game. Not knowing, like, thought, you know, we've all been to Shark Park before when it rains and it's pretty heavy sort of storms and things like that. And we always talk about, you know, where we sit in the ET stand, we're under the drip line. So I thought, well, we're going to get wet. We might as well just go and brave it, but not expecting what was there. So uh, we made our way down there. I, I think I spoke to Franco briefly and we sort of retreated back towards the corporate boxes. But even then we weren't safe from the, the storms and the wind. So... I actually uh, made contact with my brother-in-law, made our way upstairs to the upper part of the ET stand to see how the other half live and go up there and watch the rest of the game. And uh, Zach still remembers his, not anything about the game, the weather, just as we're walking up those set of stairs, we got to the upper part of the ET stand. A poor old lady was uh, trying to hold an umbrella at the time and like Mary Poppins got dragged back by the cyclonic winds and fell down about four steps. So had to help her up and he was crying and we're getting wet and, Things like that. So we went and took cover at the back, the back couple of rows of the upper ET stand where uh, some of the South players are out that game were sitting up there as well. So, yeah, a very eventful night. And, you know, you, there's always those tourist jokes where, you know, my so and so went over overseas and all I got was his lousy t shirt. Well, the Sharks were good enough to offer any of those brave fans that went there one of these uh, memorable t shirts me and Franco are wearing tonight. Uh, it says I was there, I was part of it and survived because we'll obviously go into it. Why it's got this emblem on there but um yeah they offered fans who turn up free tickets to the following game and a, and a t-shirt when they come so one of those ones you'll never forget well before i throw to franco that answers several questions because there was uh not since the consternation over whether to take the two at 42 nil down had there been a disagreement on the et stand group chat as to who was there and who should be the expert commentator for this one uh, that explains why both of you believed you were there um, but weren't 100% sure that the other one was. Uh, so Franco, the man who stayed in the e lower ET uh, and bore the brunt of it, will say, I, I reckon even the guys and girls in the Monty Porter stand would have been copying it as well, despite the fact that the 100k an hour wind was behind them, probably getting some kind of, I suppose, whirlpool action with some rain coming in either side. But Franco, what were, how did you end up down there? 
CK was just living the life of luxury up the top of ET and I was down there copying it. Gosh. Uh, you know what? It's funny. I don't think I was ever in doubt. I think I was always going to this game, sort of like you mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction there, we, we cannot come off the, uh, the, the wooden spoon the year before it was, you know, probably shouldn't have had that wooden spoon. It was almost pushed on us by circumstances at the time. And it was a real get behind the team season for me. I think I attended every, every home game and I even attended a whole bunch of away games, which for me is, is super rare. So the fact that it was, was wet and windy and miserable, it was, wasn't really a factor. It was just, I'm going to this game. I, to make matters worse, it was worse. It was a Monday night game too, right? So, um, yeah, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't a fun game to get to. It wasn't a great time slot, and uh, there were, you know, news reports coming out telling people to stay at home, don't travel, don't go to the game. Um, I was. It, they just started coming out as I was leaving, but I'd left early to go and see the um, game before it, and it was. Uh, yeah, by the time some other people started rocking out there. Oh, it's crazy. You shouldn't be here. They said, don't travel. But we came, I was like, Oh, didn't really hear that. But yeah, that's, that's nuts. Um, and they're doing the, the pregame show, which was normally, normally held down on the field. And uh, it was Gaznia sitting or standing at the, the back of the lower ET stand getting filmed and giving him a bit of stick. And he's like, Oh, there's no way I'm no way I'm going down on that field. I, that's miserable. That's awful. They don't pay me enough to get down there. Um, from memory, he did actually end up getting down there and his umbrella was going inside out and he was having a terrible time uh, as, as a sideline reporter. But it was it was just a great, great game, great moment to be at. Obviously, the result helped, but uh, I'm really glad I was there. Lots of fun. Oh, great to see that you two were there because pretty much all of the rest of us weren't. Uh, or each of us had our own excuses. I think the best of the lot was my brother, Blake, who did go to the game, did qualify for the T-shirt and left after under 20s because I don't know, madness, right? You go all that way, you ba- half the battle's getting there, for goodness sake. And he left before first grade even started to get home to watch it on the couch. I mean, anyway, shout out to you, Blake. That was one of your smarter moments or not. But um, anyway, he qualified for the shirt. So he bore at least uh, was one of those people technically. So it was 3,795 that were there. Um, but uh, or 97, sorry, doing my maths wrong. But uh, Boldo, don't know where he was. Uh, myself, I was living and working in uh, Gippsland in Eastern Victoria. One of the few times... It, it, in history, I reckon that uh, Sydney had worse weather than down there. That's a really dour, dire place with just constant southerlies and rain going sideways off Bass Strait. But uh, it was a balmy evening. I think it was single digits, but no rain. Uh, as I was watching this one going, good golly, what's going on up there? But uh, it was great viewing. So moving right along. Typical, the- typical scenario of the Fox coverage these days as well, or even nine. The camera work is so good and the, the filters they've got on there. You don't see the rain on most of those shots anymore. You know, sometimes you get the the, the, the camera shot from the, the guy carrying it on his hip and you see, oh, gee, that's a lot, of, a lot of rain. But, you know, watching the footage, it looks crystal clear, but there it was just, it was whitewashing across the field. It was, it was just intense. And just to show that the game's gone soft, I think the other games that weekend were put on delay and had, timeouts and breaks because of concern of player safety and fan safety because they didn't want people traveling um but we went there sharks were there we got our wet on it's an interesting yeah, you're right it's an interesting uh, tangent there games being d- delayed or just completely cancelled due weather or postponed it happens a lot in european football obviously with uh, ice snow rain that affects the, the pitch but the only one that I can think of in memory was also in 2015 when Lang Park flooded for the uh, Anzac Test between Australia and New Zealand on the Friday night, got delayed to play on the Sunday, and New Zealand carved up and won by quite a lot on that Sunday afternoon. But I remember there was talk of the, the match against Dragons early in 2024 this season for whoever's uh, watching later. Uh, there was talk of what Dino being down at Bunnings and buying a pump and pumping water out of the, 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 uh, the in goals and the... The, the flooded, I think, northern end, but that held up okay. But this one, if you ever you're going to 
postpone a game. It was it. Didn't happen. So play on. Um, Sharks. Yeah. Sorry, Williams, they, did, they did have discussions with the players. They actually asked them. It was actually come down to the players to see if they wanted to go out in these conditions. And they all said yes. That's the only reason they actually continue with this game. The, the NRL was willing to can it. But, yeah, the players said, no, we'll go out and play it. And probably because the Sharks probably thought they might get a little one-up on the, the reigning premiers, the Rabbitohs. So. Yeah. Well, I, did you remember Flano's uh, comment regarding that after the game? I think uh, I heard it today, so I'm just it's fresh in my mind, but I do remember oh, okay. when I heard it. I remember him saying it at the time. Yeah, I don't he remember. Said, he said uh, this is in the Triple M coverage afterwards. He said uh, the house of the players uh, and the referees, we agreed everyone could swim, so out we went. Um, <laughs> so that pretty much summed it up. But if that did happen, I wonder where they would have fitted into the schedule. We talk about a tight schedule uh condensed by period but they jammed into the origin period it, they would have had to replay it or make it up somehow you can't just go oh, give each team a point and carry on i think that their tv coverage or the rest would have need to fit it in somewhere it would be really interesting to see how they make that work um maybe be interesting, we didn't have buyers back then either so yeah so or oh, there was i suppose there were periods of downtime during the like split rounds let's call it during the origin period but it, it probably would have made it even worse, I suppose, trying to shoehorn in there. Not that we had many. Oh, we had a few players in origin. But moving forward to the form going in, so uh, we were 11th after starting the season 0-4. and four. Our illustrious leader, David Balderman, expressed uh, surprise at that, um, that if he knew his trivia, he'd know that the Sharks uh, started the season 0-4. and four. Uh, Opening round loss to Canberra, followed by... The first one in our run of the preceding five matches there was Brisbane Broncos at home, 10 points to two on a Friday night. Uh, I watched that game on delay. That was back when Channel 9 refused to show matches live and Fox couldn't simulcast. Uh, so that one, I waited up to about 11.30 to find out how bad our season was starting. Uh, next week, we played in Melbourne, lost 36-18. Uh, then Wade Graham threw it to, uh, who was it? Uh, was it Roberts? I think, to uh, run the length and uh, score an intercept try to win 24-22. Uh, then things started to change. The Easter weekend, Jack Bird on his starting debut, getting a double, winning 20-12. to And then we beat the Knights in the wet the preceding Friday, 22-6. to So started to turn the season around. Do you guys have any uh, specific recollections of those matches in there? Well, yeah. I, I'd totally forgotten the intercept pass. That's breaking my heart again all over. Um but yeah, that that Titans match uh, was Jack Bird's debut off the bench, as you said, his starting debut the week after. At the Roosters was at five eighth. Um, mm. He then continued to play five eighth for the rest of the season. But for this game that we're talking about, from his starting position of five eighth, uh, it was three from three. Um, so you know, we thought we'd unlocked him. We thought we'd unlocked the team by putting him there. And you know what? We had a pretty good season. So not half wrong. Do you remember the play that uh, started the season at 5-8 for us and then was, uh, I think it was a suspension against Melbourne that um, ruled him out and then saw us have to shake things up? Uh, was it Wade Graham? Wade Graham played 5-8 to replace his player in the game against the Titans. Right. Uh, th then we realised that he wasn't a half. He started as a half. He was great uh, in his career, but he was obviously a much better back, back rower throughout the, the majority of his career. I'll give Kelly a second. Going to kick yourself. He was a star really? signing. It, yeah, we, we took You're around him that Robertson off. Carney sort of era, but it's just yeah. Oh. So Car Carney departed, and we uh, availed another club of this guy. Um, he was very oh, highly Tim talented. Smith. Close, no. But uh, Tim Smith was a few years before that. He was a guy that would go on to become a grand final hero. Final, final comment. Final clue. Was it Ben Barber? Yes, it was Ben Barber. So we signed him from the Broncos as a 5'8". He bulked right. up with Brisbane. And 2015 was, I suppose, size and injury affected. So he started the year uh, against Canberra and Brisbane and Melbourne at starting 5'8". I, I believe he got suspended. I think it was for a dangerous throw. I'd have to check that. Um, and was out for a couple of weeks. And so we had Wade Graham at 5'8". Initially with Jeff Robson, uh, that didn't quite work out. So that's where we threw Jack Bird in. Uh, Flatter at the start of 2015 was copying a lot of stick. He'd started Mitch Brown ahead of Valentine Holmes early in the year, was favouring experience over the uh, the youth that we had coming through after a very successful Nines campaign where we lost the final to Souths uh, in extra time after Valentine Holmes kicked that field goal from the sideline. 
So things were starting to turn, and then we had a, a an awesome win over the the reigning well, the, the premiers from twenty thirteen, the the Roosters, and then a very very solid win over the Knights. Uh, looking at South's form, uh, so they had three wins, two losses. Reigning premiers uh, starting that run, we they beat the Roosters in a feisty affair, thirty four twenty six. They beat the Tigers when the Tigers were half decent, twenty points to six. Lost the Eels, twenty nine sixteen. They snuck home against the Bulldogs in an Easter uh, Easter Good Friday clash, I recall, uh, where there was some late controversy. The Bulldogs went ahead to lead 17-16, and I think there was some kind of off-the-ball incident between David Clemmer and one of the Burgess guys. I think from memory, Isaac Luke in there. Um, Clemmer got sent to the bin. Penalty goal was taken by Reynolds. They won 18-17, and then they got pumped was by the, the Cowboys. Was that the was James good. Graham finger match? Uh, it could have been. Don't, don't point at me. I'm not pointing this yeah. one. Uh, the one. It was actually. There you go. It was, it was very heated. I was watching that at a, in a pub in Victoria. So obviously it was on a, a small screen with no audio, but I was like, what's going on here? So um, yeah, the, the the Bunnies had a bit of form going into it. They were the reigning premiers, but you'll see with the, uh, the lineups, they were missing a few of their big guns as we scroll forward to this one. Uh, Disregard the Cronulla Sharks versus Cronulla Sharks there. Obviously, the team on your right is the South Sydney Rabbitohs. But the Cronulla Sharks side will start off with, uh, so we've got Valentine Holmes, the fullback, the wingers, Sasai Fecky, Michael Gordon, the centres, Gerard Beal, Ricky Latelli. Uh, this starting ring bells, the ring bells for those uh, fonding, or yeah, fond of a certain year, the following year. The halves, Jack Bird, Jeff Robson. The front row, Matt Pryor and Jersey 16th into the starting lineup with Michael Ennis at hooker and Chris Heinington at uh, the second prop position and the back row of Luke Lewis, Wade Graham, the captain, Jason Bakuya on in Jersey 17. And then the bench of Sam Tegatizi, Jersey 8, dropping back to the bench, Ben Barber, Anthony Tupo, Tinderau Rona, the coach, Shane Flanagan. While for the South Sydney Rabbitohs, the fullback and captain, Greg Inglis, the wingers, Alex Johnston and Joel Reddy, the centres, number 19, Dylan Walker, uh, and number four, Bryson Goodwin, the former and future Shark. Uh, here's your five, eight, number 18, Cameron McInnes, replacing uh, number six, Jen, uh, Glenn Stewart, of all people, who is in turn replacing Adam Reynolds slash John Sutton. Uh, the halfback was Luke Keary. The front row, George Burgess, Isaac Luke, Dave Tyrrell. Back row, number six, Glenn Stewart. Bizarre selection at five, eight there, but it moved to the back row. Uh, Chris McQueen and Jason Clark and the bench of Chris Griesmuller, Nathan Brown, Tim Grant, Tom Burgess, the coach, Michael Maguire. Thoughts, Chris Kelly? It looks like you're ready to hook in. Comments? Yeah, um, obviously, like we always talk about, you know, looking back at 2015 or 2016, we wish he had a crystal ball, but you could kind of feel that team that we had. There was a real good mix of youth, still a few youths to come in, but like you said, the excitement of uh, Jack Bird being included, uh, and we had the experience in Luke Lewis, Heinington, Innes, Wade Graham, uh, Jeff Robson, Michael Gordon, those kind of guys, and obviously Val Holmes coming up. Uh, we still had Ben Barber on the bench, and we still had Tupu playing around for us, so... Yeah, you kind of felt on paper, you look at that team, it's you know, a pretty good star-studded team. They should do a lot better where they started and where they finished. But, and again, you know, playing the Bunnies, they just come off, a, like we said, a premiership in 2014. So they still had a, a star-studded lineup themselves. And interesting to see McGuinness in there and uh, obviously Dylan Walker. And it's funny to see a lot of those guys are still going around in the league, if not for South, like Alex Johnson um, and a few Dylan other Walker. guys are still there. One of the but Dylan Walker, he's still at the Warriors. Seven, seven uh, still Burgess. playing. This was nearly seven 10 still playing years just ago. Seven still playing. Yeah, so Look here. Um, yeah, Side point. Nathan Brown Burgess, still going. <laughs> Val Holmes, Jack Bird. Um, yeah, you got a lot. Um, looking at McInnes and Keary's the halves combination. I don't know if you guys had heard. I think it was on the Sam Burgess pod, podcast uh, interview. I think it was with Luke Keary. Um, and also, too, it was around origin time where McInnes made his debut. It was talk about the how and the why both McInnes and Keary left uh, South around this time. Keary at the end of this season and McInnes a year or two after. Did you guys hear about that and a certain incident up at Russell Crowe's farm? So uh, apparently a very, let's say, inebriated Russell Crowe had absolutely lost to Cameron McInnes um, in such a way that uh, Keary was there and Keary was good mates with McInnes. I believe they played uh, a fair bit of juniors for South coming through the grades uh, and that was where he himself had said that was 
his turning point going, I don't want to be associated with this club. And I thought that was a pretty big and telling comment. No one's really spoken out against the, uh, I suppose, the aura of Russell. And obviously he's done an, an enormous amount for the uh, the South Sydney Rabbitohs. But um, it was things started to fall apart and fall apart quickly for the Bunnies less than a year after they won the comp. Obviously, immediately after they won the comp, Sam Burgess went to English rugby and things started to move, I suppose, probably in the, the wrong direction for them from there. So... Um, that was that. McInnes obviously went on to the Dragons and then us, but Cle- but Keary going to the Roosters. I know that obviously Latrell's done as well, but and the, the stupid book of feuds, it, it's it's not a thing. There's, it, I, I, I'm stealing your line there, Franco, but uh-huh. at the time that was probably towards the peak of the, I suppose, the the rivalry and the fact that um, Keary went to the Roosters was probably indicative of how keen he was to get out of the Bunnies. Um, not to mention that I'm sure Uncle Nick gave him plenty of money. Yeah. I didn't know. I knew of the uh, the Kiri side of that story. I didn't know of the McKenna's involvement. So that's interesting. Yeah, it was. I found it very interesting in the fact that it was it was being spoken about in multiple channels in the media around the time of McKenna's debut as well. Um, so obviously these are just uh, points of opinion from these players, but uh, whether it's truth, there's smoke this far, I suppose. But yeah, you're right. That that team of ours, uh, obviously Jeff Robson. Uh, would be one that would move on at the end of the season, uh, had done so much for us. But uh, just get getting Maloney um, unlocked so much for that side. Uh, Michael Ennis was only in his seventh match for the club. Um, and he has some interesting things to say. I heard him his interview uh, in my research today, his interview with Triple M afterwards, and he said something huge. So I'll save that to the end. But we'll roll forward to the match if you guys are, are ready to to rumble on that. Just a, just a quick one on this. We... We spoke about um, Reynolds being out of the match, mm. but for us, we had Paul Gallen out and we had Fafita out. Um, You're right. So I imagine we, we call that even, do we? Is that at least even? I'd say so. Um, so the the coverage said that what Gallen was out with a hip injury. I'm actually not sure why uh, Fafita was out, but yeah, they, they're both he key outs. Yeah. That Ford pack, though, like, couldn't gosh, swim. Like, <laughs> That forward pack just, and we'll talk more about the 2015 side shortly, but uh, that, I suppose, strike for you, anyone. Uh, so rolling forward, uh, so the Sharks, I take it would have lost the toss, I'd argue, given the fact that they were running towards the northern end so that the breeze of their backs, but this breeze was only intensifying. Uh, early on, we had some field position, uh, swung at right, and Michael Gordon got in for the first try at wide on the right. There'd been a fair bit of chat pre game about Gordon, the fact that this was the first time that Valentine Holmes was starting at fullback, uh, which was surprising to me because I remember him scoring uh, that try against the Roosters uh, in our first win of the year and then the, fo- the the following week against the Knights also scoring on the wing. So uh, the fact that they they had been changing mid-match, but the fact that uh, Flanagan had named him at starting fullback and Gordon on the wing, I suppose, really showed his hand as to where he thought that the club was going. So um, Gordon scored early. We'll bring up the footage of that one. We've got a few videos to show you, but for our Spotify listeners, we'll try and uh, give you a bit of oopsie. That didn't load properly, so I'll just bring that back here and we'll try and give our Spotify listeners a bit of audio, of uh, commentary. Here. So, Ennis, uh, why is that doing that? I'm going to blame David Baldwin for this. Here we are. Okay, so it's pretty poor coverage. Sorry, it, we get a bit of an offload away, it gets out to Beal. Who gets it? Your tip pickups. Yeah, here we are. Now that's, that's a, a bit more flowing. So, yeah, great pickup by both of them. International Gerard Beale and Gordon goes in. So, not sure what's going on with that video there. Uh, obviously, more technical difficulties there, but we you, you get the drift. That uh, a second play, phase player. Who was that offload in there from? That was from. Is it Hyington? Yeah, I think it might have been Hyington. Yeah, she might have been Bird. No, it was Jack Bird. It was Jack, Jack Bird. Bird. Yeah, so Jack Bird, and then yeah, got attention of two defenders, gets it out the back, and away we went. So obviously the terrible conditions to score on the corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, terrible conditions. So the kick actually from Michael Gordon, it's like an arrow. Yeah, it was a didn't didn't go too far off uh, getting it. But uh, didn't, didn't swing. It went straight as an arrow. Yeah, yeah. I think he was intending for it to, to hit the wind and bend in, and it just 
Went yeah, the face of the post. Yeah, and Gordon had a very straight kicking style as well. So, um, but yeah, obviously he kicked it too hard on that occasion. Or maybe the yeah, the breeze just died off for a second while he kicked it. Uh, luckily, it stayed on the tee, rolling forward. So we we had some more good field position. Uh, we were holding the ball early and got back downfield. And here's a bit of crafty play from Michael Ennis out of dummy half. And he's a real talking point. We're really starting to see the uh, the rewards of having a, a, a crafty hooker. Uh, Ennis, of course, taking uh, or coming to the Sharks in a bit of a swap of sorts or a, a uh, unintentional swap between him and uh, was now Michael Leisha, who was the next big thing going to the Bulldogs and going from there. So, so Ennis out of dummy half, this video works. Yeah, shapes, did a little dart and sneaks through, and Lewis dives over. So, it gets between Keary and one other South defender there. Unfortunately, he's frozen there, but Lewis just waltzes on through and, and picks up the scraps and scores. So, so this one was an interesting one because it didn't show it on that footage, but just before then, um, they they sprinted to get into position for that one. So that was a, a set play. That was someone called that. Um, and both uh, both players ran to get into position to get ready for that NS grubber. Um, so that was... You know, certainly, certainly something that you wouldn't really associate with with the sharks there, and it just sort of showed, as you said, that that crafty play from Ennis, and and in that weather as well, right, a bouncing ball along the wet deck, it's it's always a good option. Yeah, absolutely. And just how much Ennis showed or created in, in the early part of the season, I remember him scoring his first drive for club against the. Uh, uh, the Titans in that loss that we had, but he he basically set up and finished that try. He was just adding so much more out of dummy half. I must admit, I may be in the minority here, but when you saw, oh, I'm not in the minority. I know this assigned him. I thought, oh gosh, he's well past it. He's he's all over. It's another Corey Hughes special, and just added that much more. And he became the the outside of Jack Bird, the key po- focal point of our attack as we rolled forward. Uh, the we're not going to show this because we don't have the video and it's South, but Alex Johnson scoring an Alex Johnson try uh, nine years ago. It looks identical to pretty much any of the other ones he scores here. The, the bunny's got downfield. Uh, it was, I think he's 26th or 27th try of his career. Um, what a young pup. Yeah. Yeah. So 20, yeah, 26th try. Good. That's a great set, Franco. So it shows how, how long ago that was. But yeah, spread it to the left, scored in the corner. And uh, it was Isaac Luke with the kicking duties with uh, Adam Reynolds out. I'm not sure what it was, but I heard um, Michael McGuire post game saying he was out for six weeks. So uh, sounds like something was sort of soft. It was out of that. Um, it was out of the uh, the Easter game you touched on, where he had his legs dived at. Oh, uh, right. okay. Jess Kane style. Yes. So that's that's what the whole blow up happened was. South were awarded yeah. a penalty for the Bulldogs, so he had his legs dived at. So yeah, right, it was a big, okay, big talking point out of there. Okay, so anyway, so South scored the all important, all important third try, which again has proven to to not result in a victory. Sorry for the spoiler alert to the team that scores the uh, the third try, but uh, Sharks went to the break ten points to four. And I remember watching it going, oh, geez, we had such a good opening, and if we just let this game slip there, ten points. Do you is... do you remember what happened at the end of of the half? Yeah, we can touch on. I'll let you divulge it, but we had some ball downfield. And then something happened. What happened, Franco? Well, we, we had a full set ready to go right on the uh, right on the south line. Winded our backs uh, about a minute and a half, two minutes to play, and we set up for a field goal. And Holmes whacked it wide and and missed, fluffed it. It was so. Uh, yeah, I similar. think a, a one point one point yeah. kick, one point. Goal was not going to help us win that game, but um, oh, it was an interesting I don't idea. Mind the idea. Gave them seven, gave them seven tackles, and they they got down the other end. They got they got scarily close. That's scarily close. And if that if that was ten all, gosh, that would have been. But I think I don't mind the idea of going seven, having a more than a converted try lead in the wet, because that you probably think, oh, we're getting a bit of field position, maybe Jake a penalty goal or two, and then grind the game out. But it's six points, like, ugh, and then you. Bang on, given the fact that it was first tackle. It's like, just play the set, see if you can get something. Uh, it was eerily similar to the uh, the Nico Hines spray against the Bulldogs, actually, in position and strike and everything. Just 
lashed it and went went left. But you, anyway. you got to remember as well, like any points of that on that night, like these were hundred k wins that was swirling around the stadium. Like I expected no points. I I didn't expect any goals. I probably didn't expect any tries. I thought the game might have ended nil all, or if not, you know, two nil was about it. It was it was horrendous. Hundred k hundred k wing wins a flooded ground and you're going to do a drop kick at the posts. It doesn't sound like a smart play to me. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I'm probably too harsh by comparison. We've never been, we've never been he, smart. <laughs> yeah. The fact that he got boot to ball and it actually for a second looked like it was going to go through, was that was a feat in itself. Uh, there was a game in two. The only reason I know the year was I was in year 12. It was 2006 at Cogra, Dragons versus Eels. And was it nil all up to about the 70th minute? And then can, Eagles pop a field goal. It was the you can ask my wife about that bad. game. She she got dragged along to that one with the, uh, the family, cool. and she still reckons it was the coldest she ever felt in her life. She had a couple of couple of layers on, was still soaked through. And yeah, it was it was coming down to the final. There was a, a dodgy call at the end of the game, it was the only reason a try was scored it, off a drop ball yeah. into it off the back of a scrum. So it was gonna be three yeah. two. It was yeah, the three two two one or so. It was yeah, you're right. Actually, it was three two, wasn't it? It was going to be three two, terrible. Yeah. And was that what three field goals to two or something? So was there a penalty goal in there? Yeah. I can't remember. But I anyway, we'll say that the conditions weren't as bad as this one. I don't think any games have had conditions as bad as this one. But uh, being the the eels and the dragons in was that two thousand six? Yeah, they were both worse than these two teams in this year. So they just couldn't score. Where the sharks and south could score points, but Rolling on to the uh, second half, really early on, uh, one of the Burgess brothers, I think it was George, had a try disallowed, somewhat controversially based on the the coverage I was listening to today um, about it all. I, I, there's only a very brief replay on it. Apparently, it was a double movement. Um, there was apparently some thought that it could have been given a try. I don't think so. I thought he's, he's, maybe it was the slow-mo that I was watching, but his arm seemed stationary and he pro- promoted the ball. It was very close, though. It was a, a blade of grass in it. He's just promoted a little bit. If, you think in the wet, he could well have slid over, uh, but it was, it was disallowed. A, it was a clear double movement from my yeah. point of view. And uh, the the commentators on Fox were all pretty much instant agreement that it was, yeah, double movement. Red I'm going off. On. I listened today to the, and I'm surprised it was there. I was trying to find a couple of articles on it, and I found the, uh, the wash-up on Triple M. Uh, or the, the verdict, I think they call it, the 30-minute post-game show hosted by your mate Dan Ganane. Uh, Peter Sterling was on it, Andrew Johns, Bill Harrigan. It's a pretty good listen, actually. Uh, and there was a bit of uh, heated conjecture uh, about why it should have been a try from Dan Ganane and Andrew Johns. Uh, and it was Sterling and Bill Harrigan shouting them down going, no. But I suppose that doesn't surprise me when it comes to Dan Ganane and Joey Johns, even though it was close to 10 years ago. Uh, they... Most certainly had money righty on Souths, but anyway, <laughs> that's uh, that's probably why that was the case. Um, anyway, so Burgess no try. Then we went downfield. I think Ennis actually almost scored there, but it was disallowed. Uh, anyway, we got a penalty goal. We'll go twelve four up, and I was feeling a bit more confident and comfortable there. I don't know. Actually, comfortable is not the word, but a bit more confident with an eight point lead. Um, and then something terrible it was happened. never comfortable when you're at the game, Williams. <laughs> yeah, no, certainly not. I was I was watching from the uh, uh, well. Actually, initially I was at work, so I was seeing bits and pieces there, and then listening to it on the radio in the car, streaming through my phone. Got home uh, right on half time, and then it was like, okay, here we go. We'll see what happens, and then I thought, okay, perfect start to the second half, and then this happens. Do you remember what happened here? I suppose at the game, you what happened with the kickoff? Uh, Greg Bird, uh, Jack Bird drops it. Yeah. Yeah. And then that South it. with the door basically reopened for them again, field position and a grubber as tends to happen in the wet and Chris McKean with the try, Chris McQueen with the try. Uh, 54 minutes gone, Sharks have their lead cut to two and it's a long way to hold, long way to go holding them out from there. But somehow we did, don't have too much by way of details of the actual match, but we just, our forward pack just ground it out and uh, – when time allows, I'll go back and watch the replay in full because I was only skipping through it over the last few days. But it looked like it was just lots of kicking to the corners from both Jack Bird and Jeff Robson and Ennis out of dummy half too, just uh, get uh, just holding the ball, whatever it took, and just hoof it back downfield and play the field position game and just 
ground south out of it. South had plenty of attacking sets as well, and we just just swarming defence, slid when we needed to, but really it was a lot of just up and in in the wet, which is obviously very fatiguing. But getting up and just smothering, they couldn't they couldn't get a fast play of the ball, they couldn't get clean ball out of dummy half, and we just smothered them. So. Uh, any particular memories of, of that, I suppose, that period trying to grind it out in the second half? I guess for right. me, it was, it wasn't anything new for the Sharks. That grinding was a sort of really came into the forefront with, with Ricky Stewart. Um, yeah. It was, it was, you know, losing, losing games by a couple of points, winning games by a couple of points. The old cliche of, of dragging the opposition down to our level. I was not a fan of, of that, that mentality, that style of play. And I'm not a fan of it now when people say, but the Sharks DNA is gritty defense and drag them down. And it's like, Oh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure the Sharks DNA is, is flashy, entertaining backline moves, but you know, uh, it, it did work. And in, in, especially in these conditions, it was by far the right thing to do. It's an interesting question for another day as to what you prefer. I miss that defense so much right now. I miss that ability to go, okay, we've dropped the ball, but we'll back ourselves to hold them out. It's just, yeah. Anyway, that's it. What would you rather, flushy attack or, or why not both? Defense? Yeah, I, exactly. The, the, the aim, the key, yeah, the dream is both, but it's just not to be at the moment. Kelly, do you have any, I suppose, memories or comments about the, um, the style of play that we had? Yeah, I, I suppose during that period, you remember it was a rough period. We've gone sort of through the Asada and all that sort of stuff. So we used to sort of say, you know, we want to win a comp and I don't care if we win by a field goal or extra time. But um, I'm pretty sure I was about 10 years younger and a lot uh, less greys were going around until this sort of period of drag them down and, and rub it out because the grand final literally took that many years off my life um, and so do these games because it was just games. I was confident, you know, in the 2015, 2016, 17 year old, like come the 10 minutes, we're up by two. I was pretty confident back in our defence. But, God, it was hard to watch because it was just torturous because we weren't going to offer anything in attack. We were just like, well, back our defence, like you said, kick them in the corners and bore them out. But, God, it was just, oh, the heart couldn't take it. Good thing Gus Gould wasn't commentating this one because I'm pretty sure you would be dead if you played a drinking game with him uh, or ha you having to drink every time he said Bermuda Triangle with these conditions. Bermuda Triangle. But, yeah, so there de definitely was a Bermuda Triangle um, a feel to it. But uh, it will add to the stage the final try uh, in the 74th minute. We'll get that working again. And uh, we've got Ennis out of dummy half again. So play the ball, Heinington, Ennis, darts left, grubber in, ricochet, Bakuya, regather, try next to the post, try sealed, game sealed, and the good guys have three games in a row. Um, obviously, you guys... I don't know what G.I. was trying to do there. Like, it just sort of stuck out a leg and it just bounced off his shin and... Yeah, you're right. What, he I don't did, know what he was uh, trying to do there, which is bizarre. Like it wasn't. He, I know it's yeah, wet conditions, he, but he sort of gets wrong footed on. by it, and it just comes like it's not like him to do those kind of. Mistakes, well, I think but, yeah, he stabs it back in off the side of his boot, and then it, yeah, uh, so he sort of gets wrong footed, but he still sticks a leg out. It's. Um, I think the Ennis dart because yeah, he obviously shapes right, goes left, and the fact that he moved our dummy half, and then yeah, so it. I think Franco's bang on there. The fact that he gets it off the outside of his right boot, but maybe even aiming straight back at the post or right adjacent to them, meant Inglis couldn't the, react. Uh, yeah. The play before this one, they were looking at doing the similar sort of scenario. Uh, Bakuya was ready for it then, and I think Ennis changed his mind last minute and gave it to Hyington to, to take a, a hit up. So it was certainly something they were looking to do, but it was something that Ennis saw that made him call it off. And then the next play, ready to go, uh, let's hit it. So whether it was wrong position or players in not the right spot, I'm not sure. But we also got this set off a, um, off a penalty where I think Holmes was stripped. Um, and so we got a full set at their line to, 
to get this one. So it was all a little bit. Yeah, nice. you even see that setup where they're, where they're set up in that attack sort of formation, like Jack Bird's out lot. onto the the right hand, the right hand side. But there must like you said, there must have been a call because it was the second row for Souths run about five meters offside to try and shut it down, and that that allowed the gap to occur. Like it was, it was close to going himself, if not. You know, three other sharks could have scored that try if not for a deflection. Like we would have got the yeah. ball back 100 percent the way the ball was going into the in goal area, which we, me and Franco, enjoy a little grubber in there, a little reset restart if we can. Oh, so grubbers 60 percent of the time work every time, but we're rolling straight forward in the talking points with Ennis, and that's it's topical right now with Braley. Uh, a little bit to do with I suppose the um, the hooker we had play on the weekend as well in Beryl, but. Ennis was just watching this game so dangerous and he didn't know what he was going to do. And he was a genuine additional playmaker, focal point at dummy half. And I don't think, I'm trying to think if we've had it before or since, uh, just you're right. They had the, 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 the attacking, I suppose the deep set line to the right. It was, I'd actually argue there was even opportunity to the left. If he, um, I'm not sure if it was Robson or anyone floating at the back, but there was players in motion to the left as well. Uh, but, that second row jumped out of line. He had the opportunity, puts the grubber through. Braley just, I don't know, he ran a bit the other night in the game against the Cowboys uh, in that loss, but it just doesn't provide that added layer of doubt in the defence mind. Um, you just know that he's going to shovel off to someone and there's no kicks out of dummy half. Uh, Ennis, a lot of jumping out of dummy half, which is, is one thing I don't like is when it, you see it's Segiari used to do all the time. he just pick it up and take a step. Not a, it was a telegraph step. It made no sense. It's like, just get clean play, clean ball out of the ruck where Ennis is constantly looking left, shaping right, or looking right, shaping left, or looking right, going right, because the, and and. The, the marker, the defence was always in doubt as to where he was going. He's not exactly fast. He's at the end of his career and he was, I'd have to look at the stats, but I think our highest try assist um, maker uh, in 2015. Sorry for the poor English there, but it was a, a real focal point of our attack and just added so much uh, in addition to all the youth we had coming through with Holmes and Bird and the like. So uh, while we, I suppose, Frank, I'll start with you, your uh, thoughts on Ennis in early 2015? Yeah, so um, you made a, a, a comment on, you know, you said it, it wasn't a unique scenario, um, but the idea of people not being a fan of the Ennis signing, wanting to keep the, the young gun coming through, Michael Lisha, um, terrible signing, what are we doing? And a lot of that really stemmed from the, the the grub persona. But also, you know, you, you touched on he was towards the end of his career. He wasn't fast. He, you know, maybe didn't have it anymore. That game um, might have been in 2014 uh, against the Bulldogs after it was announced that Alicia was going there and Ennis was on his way out. Um, Ennis had a point to prove in that game and he, he won them that game and he even scored by grubbering through for himself and trampling over a couple of Sharks players to get to the ball and score. And he, he let Leisha know that he still got it. And, you know, and he, he proved everyone wrong coming to the Sharks. He had a lot of, a lot of zip about him. He had a lot of creativity. He still had a lot more to give, which, you know, in hindsight and, and the rest is history. By the time 2016 was over, we were asking him to sign on for another year. Um, but this game was interesting. He he wasn't captain. Wade Graham was the captain with uh, with uh, Paul Gallen out. But Ennis behaved like the captain. He was he was marshalling the troops. He was directing players. He was to, he was the one talking to the ref. He was the one telling the ref we're taking the two or we're taking the sideline, whatever. Uh, the tap. So he was he was really the the spiritual captain, I guess. There and and Wade Graham took a back seat, and pretty much the rest of the team did. So he had a, a really good game here. A couple of funny moments was the um, the the tap and goes. One was in a um, in an offside position where he wasn't allowed to take the tap, and he took it and ran ran fifty odd meters. And when they were walking back, someone sort of patted him on the back of the head, and he took offense to it and turned around and went to balked to throw the ball at their head and 
and everyone had a bit of a laugh at it. And then the ref got in it as well and sort of said, no, no, that was the wrong player anyway, Ennis. And so that was pretty good. And it was like, ah, oh, you know, Ennis being Ennis. But then in the second half, uh, similar scenario, there was a, a penalty where he took a quick tap and he ran another 50 metres legitimately. And, and in this this weather was, was a great play. So really, really sort of he had this game on, on a string. Yeah, unfortunately, I do. Uh, speaking of quick, quick taps, so and this is we're talking about all the good stuff with Ennis. I remember distinctly in the 2016 quarterfinal in Canberra, him taking the tap. Um, I think it was one occasion he took the tap, and that's when Wade Graham got monstered and knocked out of the game. And there was another one, although just before, just after, where Ennis thankfully didn't get HIA'd, but uh, he also got monstered and lost the ball uh, by the the massive Canberra um, forward pack. It might have been Papa Lee as well. So one of them was uh, Leila, the other one was Papa Lee. But Ennis added so much. Uh, he has since said in an interview regarding his time with the Bulldogs, he got overcoached uh, by Des and basically constrained. Um, constricted to doing, just feed it on to Hodkinson and Reynolds. Uh, and then he was able to come back and play proper footy under um, Flanagan, and that's what he was signed to do. That's one of the, the big selling points to going the Sharks to end his career was to be able to do that. You look at it too, he was the Bulldogs captain for quite a few years in there, um, missed out on one of the grand finals. I think it was one in 2014. He missed out with a was it broken foot. Um, so he had a point to prove. He also started his career in the halves, uh, coming through the Newcastle uh, system. So like a lot of those good players did. So the fact that he was a half and the fact that he had that uh, that ball playing ability, he wasn't a, a um, I suppose, a, a pigeonholed hooker. He was a guy that could play footy, just happened to be at hooker. Uh, and then just that all those leadership qualities, all those stories about it, that, that the quarterfinal against Canberra when they're down 12-0, should have been down 18-0, and he's there going, look, guys, we've got every excuse under the sun. We can go up the highway and, and tell everyone how how – how done we were with injuries and the like, uh, or we can turn around and play footy and make something of it. So, um, got so much time for Ennis. It's a shame he's become a gun for hire uh, in his post uh, career. Kelly, uh, thoughts from yourself about the great man? Yeah, I back up on what you guys said. Like, there was a lot of times that you thought he was coming over here as part of a retirement. I was, you know, I had a chat with a Bulldogs mate, and we sort of got into it at the time because I was happy that Leisha was going because he wasn't playing 80 minutes at that stage. And I'd seen enough of him that he wasn't going to be an 80 minute player or sort of kick on or come back to bite us. So I was happy to take the swap, but it was that more that sort of downside of how much we actually going to squeeze out of what's left of the lemon. So, um, you know, he was a journeyman, he got around, but then, you know, doing the review of the 2016 grand final that he sat down and did, you know, he called that game winning try to Fafita. Like it's like Franco said, there was a lot of times he was um, sort of running the ship. And especially in this game, you can sort of see where he's, he's looking back. So James Maloney gets a lot of credit, but it was a lot of Venus sort of running the, running the team out there and letting those guys know like who was in charge. Uh, they called for the ball. He was happy to let it go. He was never sort of, not nah, my turn. I'm going to go this way. So, um, yeah, the, like you said, the rest is history and a really good player that I'm glad we sort of got on and stays there as, as our premiership winning number nine. Yeah, the, the big takeaway, I'll finish off on this here, was the the interview with uh, Triple M, with I think it was Andrew Johns post-game uh, at the time, and he said it was the gutsiest win of his career, the uh, gutsiest win that he'd been involved with this this game. So um, that there, I was like, wow, that's obviously he's had a, a, a huge and storied and long career with uh, starting with the Knights, then going to the Broncos, the Dragons, the Bulldogs, then us. Uh, and to say that, I was like, wow, that's, um, that's a huge call from a... Uh, a player that has done a lot. He would then go on to play Game 3 Origin, which was a record win to Queensland, but not of his doing. Um, so following on with that, the Holmes-Gordon conundrum had just started. Uh, a lot of the media talk was what's going on with Michael Gordon. He wants out. He doesn't look happy. Um, Flanagan was interviewed post-game and said that uh, or Joey Johns had mentioned uh, that he watched Gordon very closely when he's uh, interchanged at the 30-minute mark and said Gordon looked very unhappy, was kicking stones and the like. Uh, Flanagan played it down and said, oh, he, he knows his position in the team. It's a difficult um, challenge, good challenge to have for all the cliches and also said that Gordon had a shoulder injury. Uh, so what do you guys remember of this one, obviously, that Valentine Holmes was, was, I think it was his first game starting at fullback. Uh, he would then go on to to very much play a lot of wing 
uh, for the remainder of this season uh, with Gordon getting back into the, the fullback position. But there was some real talk there for a while that uh, that Holmes was the future, he was the guy, and Gordon would be moved out. Um, thoughts? I mean, just on the season in general, I always felt sorry for Gordon. He He did seem like he was the one missing out or being shafted or you know it's it's one of those one of those scenarios where everyone gets their turn to miss out it's okay but nine times out of ten it's gordon that's going to get his turn to miss out um i i did you know he's he he you know he, another player that was probably his best was behind him at this time but he was still a good player he still wore his heart on his sleeve um and it was just it always was a bit sad to see him cop cop the brunt of this. Um, in this particular game, it was um, it was sort of uh, yeah. You, you sort of touched on it. First thirty minutes, he was fullback, and then you know I think maybe one or two plays um, he'd swapped with Holmes, but majority it was him at fullback. And then Barber came on, and that was it. His game was done. It was Barber at fullback for the rest of the game, and I think that sort of indicative of, of how the season sort of panned out. He he was there to to know his role, but his his role was to just I don't know. I don't think I don't think Flano had the heart to, to drop him at that stage or he wasn't confident enough in Barber, one of the two and and he just always seemed to to get the raw end of the stick. Yeah, Barber still had the the, the body shape of a five eighth or built up, so he didn't have his speed. He had a lot of injury troubles as well throughout that season. And Gordon had that, I suppose, depth. There was a very real chance he would go to Parramatta mid season. Luckily for the club, I suppose they didn't release him because he did provide a a, a lot of coverage at fullback as with the side settled as the season went on. Uh, but yeah, you're right. At that point in time, I was like, "Oh, Gordon looks like he's on his way out the door, and he's big money signing." And in the coverage I was listening to, still, I was talking about how much of the salary cap you, you're holding him. He he's your star fullback, and you're basically playing him at either off the bench or the wing. That's something you've got to deal with. Uh, but I suppose that's the the uh, um, I suppose unfortunate byproduct or the fortunate, depending which way you look at it, of having talent like Holmes and Bird coming through. So uh, he did. Finished that try there at on the wing, but had been playing a bit of fullback. And in the coverage I was listening to, too, they were talking about how uh, they could use it throughout the season and say you could you could have uh, Gordon um, and Holmes doing similar to what the Roosters had done a year or two before with uh, Minicello and Tuovasashek. Tuovasashek was clearly the uh, the up and coming fullback, but he hadn't got his attacking skills, his passing game up yet. So Minicello would uh, remain there in attack. Uh, with two of us to check as a finisher, but then you'd start to at certain parts of the game switch and swap them around and and develop the guy um, while still having the safety blanket of having the uh, the three hundred game fullback um, that Minichello thereabouts was. So, Kelly, do you have any uh, thoughts on this one? Yeah, like like Franco, I was, I was um, wishing we saw the Flash Gordon of Penrith. I was a massive fan when he was out at Penrith out there, being Flash Gordon and tearing us up and running full length of the field tries and things like that. But, yeah, it was a little bit behind him. He kind of, I was just thinking about it. It kind of reminds me of when we got Morris over from the Dogs to the Sharks and and then sort of, you know, Gordon was the same, went on to another club, then ended up at the Roosters. And it still wasn't the handy play, maybe like a Jennings that's at the Roosters, doing a job in the centres, but not the same sort of play they were back when they first sort of started. So um, I wish he was, but it was kind of like we've got even the situation now, the, the whole Eero, Stone Street, Talakai situation where – who do we keep and who do we select and things like that. So um, handy goal kicker, but it was, yeah, you can see Ben Barber. It's kind of like when we sent Jack Bird as well up to Brisbane, put on the weight to play 5-8 slash lock. I don't know what kind of regime they got up there. There's been rumours and stories for many years, but whether it was McDonald's, but, yeah, Barber was not the same sort of player he left when he went from the Dogs to the Broncos and then um, come, obviously come good later on at the end of the season and then obviously 2016 was absolutely electric. So, uh, yeah, wish we saw Flash Gordon, but it was obviously a bit of a, a, a downturn being at Corella and felt sorry for him because he went through the whole 13, 14 sort of saga. So, uh, yeah, a nice reward, but you know, these things happen. It's a, it's a business, as they say. So, he'd been through, you're right, he'd been through 13 and 14. He was the player of the season in 2014. I think he was thereabouts in 2013. He was just a, a great clubman, you'd say that. And then you've 
Unfortunately, he got the raw end of the deal here. He would have one awesome highlight, uh, Kelly, if I cast your mind back to when you and I covered the uh, the home game against the Cowboys way back at the start of the season, uh, back when yeah. we were winning and we put 40 on. Uh, we touched on the, the, the only other 2015 game we covered this year in this series was the home win over the eventual premiers, the Cowboys. In that game, Michael Gordon scored a 90-metre runaway try. I remember being about a 40 or 50-metre try. It was 90 metres where uh, he... Uh, outpaced Lachlan Coote to score. So he picked up a – he caught a bomb, I believe, beat a couple of guys, uh, got, in, got in the backfield, and Coote, for all money, looked like he had him covered. Um, and Gordon showed pace I hadn't seen – didn't don't, don't recall him showing for us before or since with the Sharks, but recall from his Penrith days, uh, swerving and beat him on the outside, scoring in the uh, – that would have been the southeastern <clears> corner. <throat> So, Which is funny. They probably would have crossed paths back in back in Penrith when Coop was a little junior yeah. and Flash was out there. So there's probably a few competitions out there and probably knew each other's game a little bit. Yeah, you, you bang on there. Uh, rolling forward, the 2015 team, we've touched on it. It was just that that one year before the grand final, but one year post the Asada scandal and Sterlo was talking in the coverage saying that the Sharks shouldn't have got the spoon in 2014. As Franco said before, circumstances and everything else saw them get it. Still, the 0-4 start to 2015 meant that we were the butt of every joke. We were a bit like the Tigers at the time, and I think even myself, I was like, oh, gosh, we've forgotten how to win. Um, we need a good start to the year. We're better than this, but I don't know if we're going to be able to pull it back. A couple of injuries and we're gone. Uh, this team suddenly turned around and won three in a row. I think it was the first team in history to make – it would have been the first team in history to make the top four going zero and four. Unfortunately, we know what happened at the end of the season when we wore the yellow jerseys. Uh, we almost did that and won of only a, a very, very small minority that uh, had made the finals after starting so poorly. Uh, so anything else to comment on this team? We've, we've spoken about them a fair bit. Yeah, I think it's one of those interesting ones. You, you talk about... Uh, a good team and a bad team. You never know in the moment if you've got a good team unless you're red hot, right? If you are, like, let's say you're the Panthers or the Storm or whatnot, you are red hot, top of the table, unbeatable. Unless you're that team, you don't know if you've got a good team. You don't know if you've got a middling team, right? So that you, you look at that team and it's, it's Hyington and Pryor and it's it's Wade Graham who'd been around for ages and while we loved him other other clubs would you know second guess whether or not to take him off our hands it wasn't really a team that you would go you know what most of this team is going to win us our first grand final um but they did they they were there they were the ones and you know, a lot of them had been there for a little while you know Latelli and and Fecky. Um, yeah, it, it's just those couple of little tweaks, couple of little changes, and and as you said earlier, just unlocked the team, and and they were completely different. Um, I would have I would have said, you know, every year I think we've got a great team. You, you want to have that blind faith of we're going to win, we're going to win. This is this is our year, but you know. In hindsight, some some years you look back and you go, "Oh, geez, that that really wasn't a good squad." Um, and and 2015 was was another one where yeah, you had that blind faith. But a team like that, there was there was not a lot to to praise, right? We 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 love Ennis. We spoke about how good he was this season, but even him, we were like, "Oh, a lot of fans were like, should he come to the club? Is he over the hill?" It was a really weird squad to to hitch your wagon to and say, here we go, boys, we're going to the finals. Let's take this comp by the scruff of the neck. So it was a good battling team, right? It's really, really interesting looking back on, and that's what I really liked about doing this series is you look back and you compare it against, like I foolishly thought, 03. I'm like, yeah, we've got a decent team. Sure, we've lost some good players in there, but yeah, we'll be right. We'll be If we're not top four, we'll be top eight, and gosh, we can do anything right. Wrong. Horror team. Uh, this one... 
I listened to the first couple of episodes of Sharkcast again for the first time in nine years. As I said, I was living in Victoria at the time, zero rugby league coverage down there, apart from the fact that I could get Foxtel, which was great, um, and the internet and I suppose chat and the group chat and things like that. Uh, but that was about it. So I started listening to them, but in preparation for our show, listened to their first few episodes and production value and the like. But listening predominantly, at the talking about the team, they were savage. Um, and rightly so. We lost at home. Uh, round one, 2015 to the Raiders. The Raiders just, I, was, I think the final score was 24-22, but that flattered us that the Raiders should have won by a lot more. We were poor. We were dour. We had not much by way of anything in attack. Ben Barber was the star signing at 5'8". Then he was oversized, slow, not providing much. Ennis the same um, was the view at the time because that was the view that we had going into it going, I hope they go better than they do, but it looks like it's more of 2014 and it was a self-fulfilling prophecy in it. And our Ford pack, there was criticism of Pry being slow, uh, take a teasy being, I suppose, clumsy, Fecky dropping the ball over the time, all the, all the time, all over the place. So Gordon being passed. Like my and, review with this team. Yeah. And it's, I suppose it's, it's a good reset of what we've got right here, right now in 2024 with this, the team and watching it. Nia virus went through and we'll talk about a lot more in our show in uh, on Tuesday night and the debrief and the like, but uh you bang on there, Franco, in that you don't know what you've got until you look back on it uh, or if you're going red hot. And here we weren't going red hot, but things were starting to develop. We still had Anthony Tupo at the time. He wouldn't hang around with us, but he, back end of 2015, really unlocked some um, some of the promise, I suppose, some good form that he'd showed early on and finished his career, I think, on a real high with us. Um, 39-0 match notwithstanding. But, yeah, it's something that even looking when I was going through the team of having Beal and Latelli as the centres, Bill and Lacelli never never excited me at the time, but then 2016 happened, and I look back on it with some kind of wistful um, awesomeness. Uh, yet I probably probably want the centres we have now over them, to be honest with you. But they would okay, Jack Bird and Lacelli, but still they were the guys that won as a comp. So it is the team dynamic, um, and at the moment I think we're 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 missing leadership. Where you look at this team, it was full of it. Uh, you had obviously Annis, but also Wade Graham, and even yeah. This, the, all the experience they had through the, uh, th- well, even Michael Gordon at the back, uh, Jeff Robson, the halves. So, so much experience, which I suppose that premiership window was so small in the end, unfortunately. Uh, Kelly, any final comments on the team? Yeah, I think I think you guys covered it all, but, you know, we've sort of had a bit of grit to us by then because we've gone through such a, you know, club almost going broke and going out the back door to the Asada saga, to Wooden Spoon, to the coach being suspended, to, the, you know, the most telling out of that picture of Chris Hines in there is no front of Jersey sponsor. We were stripped of pretty much all our sponsors. We we're pretty much starting from woe. So to all those Sharks fans, you're listening now and it's 2024, enjoy where we're sitting, please, because I, like I always say, you can go back to 2012, 2013, 2014 and see what it felt like. You know, like the Broncos have got a star started line up at the moment and they're, they're not going to play semis. South aren't going to play semis. We're not getting hammered in the media. Like it's, it's not that bad. Like, you know, we're in the mix, but you know, we could be on the other side of it. So um, yeah. yeah, it was like, I think Franco hit it right there. It was just, you know, you shuffle a couple of those guys in that lineup, you know, there was Barbara on the bench and your Val and your Gordon and your Jeff Robson, you shuffle a couple of those little pieces and it comes together and all of a sudden it just unlocks into a premiership. So it's, yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy. He's got to find the next James Maloney. But rolling forward, uh, Souths, yeah, we'll just quickly talk on them. Uh, obviously, they were without Reynolds and Sutton for this one. They were the big outs. Sam Burgess had left. And then they slid down, slid down hard. Uh, we would play them again in the finals. And we know how that finished for the good guys. Uh, do you have any comments? Just a quick one lines from you guys where they went wrong. Like what, they, they faded away very quickly. What, what happened? They did. They did fade away very quickly. I think it was a bit of um, retention and signings that, that sort of let them down. Um, if you if you look at this team, I was surprised to see players like Joel Reddy, Glenn Stewart. Um, you know, it was just one of those pieced together teams. It wasn't it wasn't a a, a squad that you would remember South having. And this was seven rounds after winning. A grand final um you know it's it was a shell of the former team that they were and i think you know it was it was i don't 
you, you touched on earlier, maybe there was rumblings behind the scenes. They, they, you know, set out what they'd achieved to set out. It had been a long time. They've really, the narrative for them started with getting re-entry into the comp and, um, and working their way to this point. It was almost like a pressure valve of release and, and we're done. Thanks very much. Let's bask in the glory because it wasn't a good year, a year for them. Yeah. It was, um, we'll, we'll do it in the, uh, the wrap up in a sec, but there was a pretty momentous, uh, I suppose, statistic that, that came out when we knocked him out in the finals. Uh, looking at it, similar weather matches. So this was the one that took the cake, I reckon, but there was plenty of others in our history as well. 1996, uh, in the middle of an East Coast low, we beat the Knights 22-0. Uh, covered that quickly in one of our other episodes. In our, I think we looked at our top five wins to nil. That was against a, a pretty much full strength uh, Newcastle Knights side. A double to Paul Donaghy and some tries to some other legends as well. Saw us win that one in terrible conditions. There was about five thousand people there for that one. Uh, Two thousand and four, we played a game without rain, but it was an East Coast low again against the the Bulldogs, howling suddenly. Uh, the dogs won that one. I think it was thirty-seven to twenty-eight or something along those lines. Uh, pretty high scoring, given the fact that there was a, a close to a hundred k an hour southerly, and just both teams with the breeze put plenty of points on. Uh, Hazamel Masri kicked a cracking field goal from the right touch line, and sorry, p- a conversion from the right touch line in that one, uh, where he basically kicked it, basically across field a 90 degree angle to the goal uh, and then the the wind carried it through it's been replayed plenty of times now you can w- look it up online uh, and then one that i just stopped so that one that was also at the match in 2010 which was from the uh, so 2007 against the the warriors we lost 12 points to two that was the same weekend that the pasha bolka incident up in newcastle happened but uh well i suppose on weather we'll touch on your guys shirt uh, the theme kelly why you're the merch guy why that picture? Oh, this picture, uh, credit to these boys that turned up to the match and they got plenty of coverage. So there was a couple of young fellas turned up in scuba gear uh, down in the front in the uh, in front of the Monty Porter stand and standing down there up against the fence wearing the full scuba gear. So the uh, I think guys was, at Marketing I think it was got worse, together. Kelly. I think they were yeah, down was, family land. They were just fully exposed. So they moved around throughout the game, but they sort of they stayed in their wetsuits and, you know, those sort of gutter areas where... Um, quite full and they'll pretend they'll swim in. So uh, there's been a few other situations in the NRL. We've seen games like that as well. You guys have turned up to try to emulate it. But this is, I think, the first time that uh, fans have actually turned up in full-length wetsuits and scuba gear. So um, so the team, the team obviously got together and put put out these shirts and said, I was a part of uh, Shark Storm Ramondas. And it's got the date on there. And it's obviously Franco turns around there. It's got the scuba mask on the back. So as a Sharks member. But... I do know there was another game I went to once in 2000 against the Roosters where we absolutely got spanked and I sat there before the Monty Porter stand was was built and I sat there and just got absolutely soaked to the bone. I think it was like by the time I hit 28 nil, I'd had enough and, and left. It was just crazy. Was so that the one? It is the Bermuda Triangle. I still – yeah. <laughs> there was one in 2000 where we actually won against the Roosters as well. Uh, where maybe we won, maybe we won then. I can't remember. It was, that, it was that cold. Yeah, yeah, that was that, that was monsoon like conditions, and our current coach Craig Fitzgibbon kicked the uh, opening penalty goal in that one, and then it just, uh, yeah, it the, there was torrential. I think Brett Howland scored a try where we just hoofed it downfield on the first tackle, and the yeah. ball just sat there, uh, and then he just towed it through and scored. But uh, this one, they were talking just a final point on the the coverage with regards to the weather on the Triple M coverage. They were talking about how good the drainage was, and it still remains the case at Shark Park about how how many mills they'd copped that day, how many mills they copped during the game, uh, and there really was only what two. They said two puddles uh, at the the southern end between the ten and the twenty meter line, uh, which were then re. Uh, I suppose that was Dan Gadane and Peter Sterling talking before Bill Harrigan goes, "Pull your heads in, guys. They're 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 lakes that are formed there, but still the fact that comparing to what would have been the case maybe at the SCG or Leichhardt or any of the others or Brookvale or even Shark Park back in the day, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, would have been an absolute mud pit. Um, so it shows how far the game has come. Uh, as we finish off with the wrap-up, so Sharks 18 tries to Michael Gordon, Luke Lewis, Jason Bakuya, uh, Val Holmes 2 from 2, Michael Gordon 1 from 2, defeated the South Sydney Rabbitohs 10, Alex Johnston uh 
misspelling there, and Chris McQueen with the tries. Isaac Luke won from two. The Sharks have finished sixth, 14 wins, 10 losses. So pretty good recovery given they lost their first four. Unfortunately, lost the following week in Anzac round against the Panthers. So that stopped our ability to be, I think, the first team in history to lose four straight and then win four straight. So no team has done that yet. Uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, and then we also lost that final round home match against the Manly Seagulls in those yellow jerseys that would have put us in the top four uh, to be the first team to open a season zero and four and make the top four. Uh, while the South City Rabbitohs limped into the finals in seventh. Uh, so that's 13 wins, wins 11 losses. Uh, for the young ones who maybe don't remember this one, I know you guys remember this well, we would then play South Sydney week one, the final 6v7. And the big statistic was this was the first time ever that the previous year's Wooden Spooners had beaten the previous year's Premiers uh, in the finals. So Sharks winning that one. I think my highlight, so there was, what, the three tries in the first half. There was the, the Jack Bird, um, the inside-outside Luke Lewis. We'll cover it another time, but the, the which was basically identical to the try. I think Jack Bird scored against the Roosters, but um, outside-inside, so Luke Lewis with a quick inside ball. Jack Bird's flying away to score in the, uh, the right corner early on. Um, Andrew Fafita with the back spasms pre-match and being ruled out from the warm-up, which is the most granola fight, or not quite the most granola fight thing, but close to it uh, that I'd seen. Uh, Wade Graham with the great pick up to score. But then I think my favourite try was just Ennis with three runners, just like showing left, right, and then just giving it on to Tupo to just barge over under the post to the deafening roar of the Sydney Football Stadium, the old Allianz, uh, to put us 20 nil up at half time. Uh, we won't mention what happened after that in week two of the finals. And that was 2015. Uh, Kelly, anything, any closing comments for yourself before I close with Franco? Oh, it's that's I know you just touched on it. We won't go into it, but that was one of my favourite games, away games. It's right at the memory bank. I was sitting at, in the front couple of rows with uh, Lats and Boldo. There It was a nice sunny, sunny day at the SFS. You know that that smell of spring in the air and semi final football, beers flowing and the sharks running right on a, on a South team and tipping them out of the the semi final. So um, yeah, it was probably the the biggest highlight besides this game, twenty fifteen. Yeah, Franco. I just thought, bringing it back to this match, uh, we had a 7-2 penalty count in our favour, um, which certainly helps in these conditions. But on the flip side, South had 63% possession. So really, you talked about our defence earlier. We really backed our defence. We backed the grind. They had all the possession. We were, managed to pretty much keep them down their end of the field for most of it as well. So we, we had great line speed. And uh, it was probably one of those games that was was character building for not only the rest of this season, but for the season to come. That's really funny you mentioned that because in the coverage I was listening to, they said that the Sharks had won every penalty count bar one. They had the best of the first seven rounds of 2015. They had the best discipline in the competition, one of the best completion rates. And in this match, they had a completion rate of 37 from 41. So I didn't know that that stat about the statistic about um, possession, but that indicates, yeah, how we will basically, we, there was a couple of offloads in there we saw in our um, highlights, but there weren't many. We we're tucking the ball under and we're kicking early and kicking often. So um, offloads is a big one. Nine to three. Oh, South really? Nine offloads, Sharky's three. There you go. And one of those offloads was from Jack Bird. Although, does that count as an offload with a, I suppose, a player? There's a player him. hanging off him. I think it does. Yeah. It was one, one of the three. There you go. Similar to that stat in the grand final. I think we had three offloads all match um, in 2016. But before Baldo jumps on and tells us to stop talking about 2016, I will end us there. So thanks, everyone. That was that was good fun having you two guys as co-hosts. Uh, first time we can say we had 0.05% of the crowd in attendance uh, here for you uh, to provide all the gouge from the night. Uh, for those uh, listening, please hit the like and subscribe button. For those of you who were there, um, you need to, to verify. If you want to jump on and say you were there, you need to verify it with a picture of you in the shirt. Otherwise, we will say you are like some other people around here, not uh, not playing the game, telling porkies. But I'm sure plenty of you were out there. Uh, it was a momentous evening. Uh, if there's anything else uh, to add, please jump in and hit it in the comments field and we'll do our best to respond as soon as we can. Uh, another point too being 
we've got a few rounds left of this season, so we'll be wrapping up with some good ones. Uh, we've got the 64-14 win over the Knights coming up, which I'm looking forward to covering that. But if there's any games you want to cover, please put them in and we'll see what we can do. We do have one commenter in there, Sports Music God, who had um, requested the game from 2012, the Tyson Frizzell try game. We absolutely will include that next time. We play the uh, the Bunnies at home. Uh, that is next cap off the rank. We were going to do that. So in the fact that I found out we had two esteemed members uh, in our company that had been at this one. In the meantime, uh, we will say farewell and up, up Cronulla. Go Sharks. <laughs>